Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Kareem Lakani, who is a professor at Harvard Business School and also the co-founder of the Digital Data and Design Institute, or D-Cubed, uh, at, at Harvard. Uh, welcome, Kareem. Thanks, Greg. Happy to be here with you. Wow. Digital data and design, man, those are three topics that I like a lot. Right. <laughs> interview a lot of people on all those things. I don't think I've ever seen all three of them together. So kudos for your, uh, your synthesis, your de of those things. Right. Um, right. Yeah. In fact, in fact, you know, we called it, uh, we, we had a debate, like, is it D3 or is it D cubed? And, right. um, um, so my co-founder is Vladimir Yosimovich, who's a um, alum from our from Harvard Business School as well, uh, and we debated quite a bit. And we said, "Well, D three implies linearity, uh, mm -hmm. D cubed implies exponentiality, and in many ways, the effect of digital data and design is really exponential." if you do it right. And so hence we, we go by DQ. It's terrible because we have to like put the carrot and the three, you know, it, it's like it's D3 on harvard.edu, but we can't put a carrot in the URL. So it creates a whole, a whole bunch of messes, but uh, we like, we like being nerdy. Well, I should also mention you're the co-author of this book called uh, Competing in the Age of AI. And I, I don't have a copy that I can display at, at the moment. Subtitle is Strategy and Leadership When uh, algorithms and networks run the world. Now, look, I, here in Silicon Valley, I don't know how common it is at, um, in Cambridge, but we, we often have folks come from all over the world and they're like, hey, what's the secret here, right? Like, how do we become digital and use data and everything? And it's, I think for the most part, they, they want to find some easy way to bolt this technology onto the business that they already have, you know, just yeah. like, Hey, yeah. let's just, let's just add it to the organizational architecture that we have and, and, and it'll be all good. And they don't really understand, perhaps they still leave not understanding, but hopefully if we've done our job, we've taught them that it's not so simple and that they have to completely reorganize the, the, the business, right? They have to reorganize their, their business model and their operational model. And so I guess the question is, why do you suppose people are reluctant to acknowledge that or, or oblivious to it? Is it because it's just so much darn work that they hope it's not true yeah. <laughs> and they, they don't want to yeah. deal with it? Or no, I, think, I, think, I think we're not used to it. I, I think all of the above. What, what I was going to say is, you know, like I'm having a ton of deja vu these days about the 1990s uh, and when the mm -hmm. browser first came out. And if you remember, uh, the, the earliest uh, application of the internet was, was e-commerce, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, in the retail sector, there was a, a curious set of companies that decided to you know, go and sell things online. Uh, one of them was books. So Barnes & Noble and Borders had e-commerce operations. You could buy books from Barnes & Noble and Borders. Um, ultimately, in head retrospect, that was not enough for them. Uh, you had to actually be like Bezos and, and Amazon and completely rethink what would happen when a tool, the combination of web browser and web server basically reduced the marginal cost of information transmission to zero, right? Bezos redefined retail by starting from the ground up and a whole new organizational and technological architecture was born and they've kept refining their architectures, both organizational and technical. I think the mistake that most incumbent companies do, the companies that aren't coming from Silicon Valley or that, are, that aren't born natively digital is that they think it's just an add-on, right? They just think we'll just sprinkle this on top and it'll be business as usual. When in fact, you know, Conway's law for the, again, the, the nerds that are around will, will, will know that basically there's a mirroring hypothesis, right? The structure of the technology mirrors the, the structure of the organization. And if now you can have a new architecture for your technology, you need a new architecture for your organization. And I think that people don't understand, first of all. And then even if they get it, the, the change process required to make it happen is non-trivial. And, mm -hmm. and so then people don't commit to it. And also, I think too often, technology decisions 
were devoid from strategy decisions. And secondly, they were outsourced to the CIO or the CTO who didn't really have a real say at the table, the C-suite table. And that caused problems. And I think that's part of what, what you're seeing now. Yeah, I mean, typically the CIO or the CTO came up through sort of an engineering or technical background, whereas the CFO and the yeah. CMO and the CEO, those are all yeah. kind of the, the, the business folks. And so the CIO yes. is this guy's like, hey, just, you know, get this stuff done, right? Yes, <laughs> and, exactly. You know, exactly. Um, Why is it so hard? Just do it. And, like, and, they, and they saw that as a cost center, not as a, not as a, not as a enabler of business strategy. Now, I want to go way back in time because, you know, you're at Harvard and, of course, Alfred Chandler for many years yes. has sort of dominated the whole – I mean, Harvard's unique Still in does. the sense that they – Still yeah, does. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Harvard's unique, I think, in terms of how much attention it pays to um, business history, right? And so, yes. you know, he introduced this this notion of structural change, right, with the, the visible yes. hand and, and sort of the birth of this multidivisional – company, this corporate structure yes. with its silos and, and, and departments and, and so forth. And I mean, that was a monumental shift. And I think we're experiencing a shift that's equally monumental. And, you know, your book is a start, but if somebody's got to write the new, right, you know, yes. visible hand the to new describe visible hand. this transformation yeah. that's happening now, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, I mean, look, I think here's the thing that I think we should all recognize. Um, uh, so I did my PhD at the Sloan School of Management. So, right, Alfred P. Sloan uh, at General Motors, right, laid the foundation of a multidivisional firm, right? Uh, and um, uh, and then Chandler wrote about that, right? Defined it, described it beautifully. Uh, those, those books are monumental and are still relevant. Uh, and if we think about it, over the last 100 years, the multi-divisional firm has enabled this built environment that we live in, right? All the uh, 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 um, accoutrements of, uh, I'm using such a, such a technical term, accoutrements, all the, you know, all the features of the modern world, like what we take for granted, the fact that our plumbing works, our electricity works, our subway systems work, our transportation systems work mostly, you know, uh, when they don't work, we notice them. But that the the modern world we live in, the built environment that we live in, has come about because the multi-divisional firm, the firm was established, the multi-divisional firm was established, and that we were able to marshal capital, technology, and people to do productive things. Uh, and so this it's a massive achievement, right? And the shadow of that lives on to today. Most of us live in these multi-divisional siloed firms. I think what happened starting in the 2000s was that this new form of firm was emerging where, in fact, uh, data and, and, and if we call it one more thing, in those things, the, the data, the information was power and then everybody hoarded that information in their different divisions and in the different hierarchies and so forth. And what we got to see starting in the 2000s was the rise of this new type of a firm uh, out of Silicon Valley, uh, that was set up around a new technology architecture, which demanded that the data flow across the entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. Then as soon as you made that switch and you saw the data and the interactions around the data governed all types of ways your business model was set up and your operating model was set up, you saw this new type of a firm emerge. Uh, and I think we've written the first draft of that in our book, trying to make sense of it. But I, 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 think, I think a lot more needs to be done on that. And I do think that it's a, it's a real shift in the ways in which companies have been thought about. Well, I mean, the motivation behind both of these phase transitions is the same, right? It's about handling the increase in complexity, ex yes. except that, you know, the increase in complexity that happened in those days was you know, linear. <laughs> yes. Now it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's exponential. Yes. Right. So maybe talk a bit about how complexity is ultimately the, the, the enemy, right? How, well, not the enemy, but the thing that ultimately leads to the demise of, of organizations as they increase scale and scope. Yeah. Because I mean, I think, I think, I, I think, I think there are two factors that go on, 
right? Uh, there is both um, uh, technological complexity and also organizational complexity. As we increase scale and scope, right, we, we ask the organization to do more and more and more uh, because we feel it's profitable, but it gets slower and slower for the organization to do that. Um, and I think the, you know, my favorite example is the fact that, you know, you think about Nokia's uh, consumer business with their phones, you know, in many ways, they invented all the core technologies that Apple then used to create the iPhone. You know, there were, there were the, one of the first ones with the second with the camera phone, first with the web browser, first with the music phone, first with maps. They had an app store before Apple had an app store, all that stuff, right? They had a smartphone, they had an app phone, music phone, all that kind of stuff. But they were done as silos. They were done as silos. And each division was fighting for his own budget and each division was own software and his own thing and so on and so forth. Right. So just imagine the complexity. And then, and then the, what was happening is they, they pushed the, the mobile phone from a technical device into a consumer device, into a fashion device. And, and then they basically proliferated that fashion by all the different fancy phones that they had and so forth. But behind each phone was a separate organizational unit. Right. And its own ask on the factory resources, on its own ask on marketing dollars, on its own ask of blah 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 blah, all that kind of stuff, right? And then you go, then you go. What did Apple do? Apple took all of these existing technologies uh, that Nokia had invented and created a new architecture, which was this new platform called iOS, uh, and what it said that these. Things don't need to be separate. They should all be actually integrated. And we're going to push everything into software. And we're going to then, then create stuff on software through this one, one phone. Well, that required a whole new different organization than what Nokia had. And so you can imagine the complexity of Nokia trying to do this. So Nokia was trying to play catch up. And so they started to do more of these things. And very quickly, even Apple realized that they actually had to open up to this broader ecosystem because the, the shift from a consumer device to a lifestyle device, which what the, what the iPhone became and what the smartphone really became, meant that you had to create 100,000 apps, not 10 apps, not 20 apps, not 1,000 apps, not 100 apps, not 1,000 apps, but 100,000 apps and more. Because the need for like my, my phone to do what I want was way greater than what Nokia could ever serve. And so then they basically hit the complexity wall because there's no way Nokia's existing structure could create 100,000 apps, right? Versus Apple realized, and it was actually consumers that forced Apple. Remember, Jobs was not for, uh, uh, for SDKs. It was only when jailbreaking happened. Do you remember jailbreaking? They used to brick yeah. our phones. Then this oh, he, used to hate the, us. he used to hate the ISPs. He thought the ISPs right. were like parasites, right? Exactly, right. But, but, but exactly, right? But they, the complexity of so many apps to be created and the fact that consumers were saying, I'd rather brick my phone and buy a brand new phone than put up with your crappy web apps. Woke them up and said, we better create the SDK and then the rest is history. So that, that's a, like a, hopefully an accessible example of as we move to a world where we want more personalization, more, uh, more individual experiences, more customized experiences, no one company can do it all by themselves. They need a different architecture. And this architecture requires, and then you're in, the, in an exponential phase, right? The five apps, 10 apps, 100 apps, even 500 apps is more linear. When you're starting with five, 10, 100, then going 100,000, then you're in an exponential world, now two million and more apps. Mm -hmm. Now you need a different design of a company, different design of an architecture for technology, and the existing companies can't can deal with it. And you know, I think we're seeing seeing the same thing happen in the car industry now too, to some degree. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the importance of of modularity, and you know, this is something yeah. that I spend a lot of time on in in my classes, right, in my strategy classes and organizational design classes. But I think you know, modularity can mean a lot of different things, right? And, General Motors and Ford, I mean, they understood modularity. Yes. They understood yes. that you need to have right, a transmission. And, yes. and, you know, you can have a, even third-party providers and so forth, yes. and there's going to be these interfaces. 
Um, but but it's it's more than that, right? Because the difference between Ford that has its modules and Tesla that has its modules is not the fact that there's this division of labor and specialization, but that Tesla has a integration function, right? It has a platform that enables you to connect these different modules in, in a different way. And, and, and that's why I think it's not enough to simply be a software company. <laughs> there are plenty of, you have to be this company that's designed in this, in this very specific modular way, which is why Amazon would not be Amazon if it weren't for the, the Bezos memo, right? And you can right. dig into the Bezos memo. So it, it's not that it's digital native. I mean, there are, you talk about how there are companies that used to have, you'd have your CRM, you'd have your ERP. There are all these software tools, but if they can't talk to each other, then you're never going to make that, that next leap. Yeah, right? and I, I think exactly right. So modularity is necessary, but not sufficient, right? As what you're mm -hmm. implying, right? The integration piece and the mindset of the integration piece matters a ton. Right. Bezos had the, the, the famous API memo, uh, which is really, uh, you know, when I show it to executives, I go, what kind of memo is this? Right. And, the uh, and the smart ones go, Oh, that's a, this is an org change memo. I'm like, yeah, exactly. This is an org change memo. This is what he's saying. Uh, what, where information resides, where data resides and what people need to do. Uh, and, um, the, 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 the story of Bezos is one of integration and constant change of the, the platform. The platform has changed three times, you know, over, over the last 25 years of, of Amazon. Uh, uh, and similarly, you know, Tesla has shown what an integration story looks like uh, in an EV software driven architecture, uh, which, you know, like you can see, I think Kia might have figured it out a bit. It uh, looks like, but the rest of the of the auto industry is still 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 struggling. Still struggling. Now, the the book, of course, is um, is all about AI. The title yeah. is about AI. The book's yeah. about way more than AI, but the title yeah. emphasizes this AI piece. And if if you're like me, you've had all these people come to you and say, "Oh, wow! Now that we have AI, <laughs> they're thinking about Chat GPT." Yeah. You know, the book makes the point that you don't need generative AI, right? I mean, no. ge you this is. We're talking about the, the the kind of AI that you can teach in, you know, at least the concepts that you teach in an initial data science class, like that's understanding right, that's right, training that's right. and scoring, supervised learning. Yeah. I mean, you can go a long way with that stuff, right? No, yeah. no, exactly. So my my, my friend um, Armin McCrutchen at Flagship Pioneering so has, has this great slide that I bore all the time in my presentations, which he sort of lays out the four four eras of AI starting in the 1950s, right? So there was a cybernetics era, mm -hmm. right? Remember that. Um, uh, then there was the expert systems era. Uh, and then there's the good learners era, which started in the 2000s, which is the machine learning era, which is what, you know, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Microsofts brought to forth, right? Where lots of data, uh, computers getting cheaper, advances in statistics and computer science, we can now do a whole lot of prediction things. And that, that has got a, a, us up to, you know, 2023, 2022. Mm -hmm. And a lot of great stuff has happened. And in many ways, you need that infrastructure to go then do the journey of AI on top. And the journey of AI era is, I think, pretty profound and actually very impactful. And we can unpack that a bit uh, later. But but uh, the basic building blocks of what, what's needed for you to have good learning systems, machine learning systems, run your organization, right? That that is two things. It's off the shelf. Uh, the blueprint is available, right? It's not as if there's like big secrets about that. It's well understood in the economy, and you know it requires as as we are sort of dancing around this this change in the structure of your organization. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting to me is how you know proprietary know how or proprietary technologies. Those are less important. It's more about proprietary data, right? Yeah. And your networks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, I think the common misnomer, I, I was recently with the CEO of a very large company and I said, the algorithms are off the shelf. You know, they're op much of it is open source. Open source. And he the was- Companies, when they develop them, they, they open source, like Google will just open source their, their tools. It's crazy, right? And he was stunned. He was really stunned. I go, I go, because what, what, what gives you the advantage is your data and your ability to then 
connects it to your business value, your value creation, and your value capture, your business model, or your operating model. That's what the advantage is going to be. You know, I, I, we have this concept of this AI factory in, um, in our book. And, um, you know, uh, through various case studies that I teach, I sort of draw the AI factory. Oh, you need data. You know, you need a cleaning operation. You need a laboring operation. You know, you need algorithmic development. You need a testing operation and so forth, right? And I go, like, what of this is proprietary? Like, what is this? What, what of this gives you a moat? Data, in most cases, unless you have specialized data, people, most data, like let's say in healthcare, not that specialized. You can get access to lots of healthcare in many, many different ways. Easy to get. Cleaning, that's just grunt work. Labeling, grunt work. Algorithms, off the shelf. Testing and learning, well, you just said experimentation, A-B testing, you're, you're done, right? And so the, the trick is not any of those pieces. It's the whole system and your ability to then connect that system to your business model and to keep expanding the, the use cases by which the AI factory is built out. And I think that's where I think people misunderstand because they felt like proprietary advantage comes from all of the secret stuff, yeah. right? And maybe the only secret stuff really might be your data. Uh, but even that is like in many organizations, it's like so siloed that you haven't done the investment in getting the data together and so forth that you have to be working on it. Um, uh, but, but really it's to get the flywheel going of the, of the AI factory and expanding its connectivity into your business model and your operating model. Yeah. You say the AI factory is to analytics, what, you know, industrialization was to manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so I wonder, you, you know, part of what I'm interested in, as I'm sure you are, is in business education, um, how much of the old is, is still relevant, right? I mean, I remember when Wharton introduced the um, digital uh, digital e-commerce major. <laughs> Do you remember yeah. that? It was a short-lived major, and then they kind of realized, well, hey, this is, you know, this is commerce. I mean, when you think about it, the AI factory, I mean, there are still insights from operations um, that, that are relevant, oh, yeah. right? And so, you know, when I talk about inventory, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, deployments that have not yet, you know, been released, right? Software code that's being worked on. And so the whole agile movement is is really just uh, an extension of this notion of, you know, throughput economies that you get from operations, right? hundred percent. And in fact, you know, like I'm located in the technology and operations management group. That's what my home department is. Um, and what have we done in the last few years we've hired you still do the basic, cranberry case you still I do the know. cranberry case? I'm, I'm trying to I'm, I'm, and we still do Benny Hunt. i'm trying to shoot both of those cases down but um that's the difference that that's over several drinks <laughs> uh but, but oh the cranberry case for those that know is, is this very famous case of a cranberry operations national cranberry operations mm -hmm. in in of course in massachusetts the you know the the cape cod and uh, what happens with the cranberry harvest? You know, it's all about bottlenecks in the in the harvesting of the and the cleaning of these of these cranberries. You know, runs terror in the uh, in the hearts of MBA students, uh, at least at HBS still, because it's very mathy. Uh, and uh, that case, you could actually, as you were just saying, we can take the same context and apply it to uh, onboarding, uh, 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 putting online data centers, right, and the flow of uh, of hardware, right? And where, like, how long does it take for you to, in fact, uh, you know, from from specking a, uh, specking a hardware system to it being live, right? Uh, in fact, my colleague Marco said that he'd worked with a company once where the time was 12 months from the time to design the data center to the time, and it was operational to the time, like, so if, if you want to add a new piece of hardware, that spec would take 12 months for it to actually show up in your data center. And that was purely a cranberry problem. It was purely a bottleneck problem and how the, the processes were done. But what we've done uh, in the last while is actually hire people from with computer sciences and statistics backgrounds. Why? Because we feel like more and more operations are going to be algorithmically driven, right? And so we need our operations people to actually understand how these algorithms actually work and how to integrate into into the broader scheme of running a company uh, and and all the way from, you know, trustworthy AI to believe what the algorithm is telling you to how they integrate with people and what does the machine and human interface look like. 
Um, so we've got experts uh, and computer scientists across all those domains trying to make sense of that. So even our department is now changing because of this. So in many ways, the core knowledge that uh, that that, that we teach in the MBA programs isn't going to go away. It's just that application of it to new circumstances become important. The only new thing I would add, and we actually started to do that this year in our program, uh, you know, we have a, our MBA program is, uh, the first year is, is you know, a required curriculum. So we sort of force feed everybody the same curricula. In fact, the same, same material the same day. Everybody experiences that um, in the first year of the MBA program. Uh, we uh, launched this year a new data science for managers course. Uh, mm-hmm. It was optional before, and we said, uh, you know, data science in many ways is um, uh, the new accounting, right? Yeah. If accounting was an optional course, nobody would take it, but we feel it's necessary for you to understand accounting, to know about how business runs. And now our belief is that data science is the same way. Like you have to, uh, managers and executives need to understand, they, they don't need to be data scientists, but they, like, again, when people come to our schools, for, for MBAs, they don't all want to be accountants. Very few want to be accountants, yeah. but they need to understand accounting. And same thing with data science and AI. Well, I'm, I'm completely on board with you on that. I mean, I started teaching a data science class over a decade ago, but the problem then was that, you know, most of our faculty were still doing econometrics. And so yes. um, it took, took a while to kind of get it into the curriculum. Yeah. But, um, but do you still teach traditional inference? Um, and hypothesis testing, yeah, and, and, as, as, and as part as part of the run up, exactly, exactly. Okay, because you still, want, well, I mean, you know, look, A/B testing still matters, right? Your hypothesis and how do you run a proper experiment and that kind of stuff. But then we apply it to like a company like Booking, like Booking dot com runs mm-hmm. thousands of experiments a day, right? How is that? How is that engine working? Right? Just imagine uh, a company like Booking, which uh, allows anybody in the organization to run any experiment. Yeah. Right. And so, so that's again, a technological, like do they just, does everybody understand statistics and hypothesis testing and what's it, what's a control, what's a treatment and so forth. Guess what? The entire company understands that. And Better. they've built the systems to be able to do that. And it's not just the company, the executives at the highest level know that this is the only way they get the signal they need to be able to, you know, get the right Google search terms in front of the customers to click on the ad that then allows them to go to the website to click on the right right set of uh, uh, descriptors of the of the hotel so they do the booking. Well, now you talk about scale, scope, and learning, and of course, you know yeah. Chandler's book was scale and scope. Um, and when you hear when you hear scale, scope, and learning, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, learning is pretty obvious, pretty critical, pretty essential. It, did we underemphasize it at some point? Um, I mean, why is it not sort of baked in from day one when we think about strategy? I mean, is it because <laughs> maybe the world is changing faster? And so you could, you know, in the Michael Porter framework, you you, you, you stumble on a strategy and you can kind of amortize it for 40 years. And, and now you can yeah. amortize it for about 40 hours. <laughs> you know, is that, is, is yeah, that exactly, is that exactly. So look, I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, Innovation always was oftentimes an afterthought in most organizations because, you, as you sort of said, like you figured out, you stumbled into something good, and then you just milked the heck out of it for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you were like, okay, let's acquire something else. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, because the rate of change was very slow. So while there was lots of innovation scholars back in the 50s and 60s and writing stuff, it wasn't viewed as a core strategic imperative for most uh, organizations. Um, and I think, I, think, I think the last 20, 30 years have shown us that this is no longer the case. Mm-hmm. That, that, the, that the half-life of innovations is shrinking. Um, half-life of uh, value creation can shrink rather fast. Uh, and, um, and then the only way that the firms will adapt, companies will adapt, uh, is going to be through uh, through uh, as much emphasis as you have on scale and scope, you also have on learning. Now, also, I think the other thing is that uh, that those three things aren't independent things, right? Like, I think uh, your scale and scope can improve through your learning processes. 
and yeah. and as you're scaling, you can learn more. You know, like they're they're, they're interconnected. They're not independent. Uh, and I think people might have thought of them as independent things. Like you focus in on how to get more and more customers and how do you serve them at lower costs. Uh, scope was about offering them many, many different things. Uh, and, and then maybe you thought about learning. And I think what we said is like, no, in fact, they're intimately connected and that they all feed back on each other as well. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, your existing scale and scope will lead you to learn things that might help you to uh, adjust your scale and scope. But you can yeah, strategically exactly. adjust your scale and scope because you want to acquire the information that you think you're going to need, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and be like, I think, and I think the, the, the example that sort of always blows me away, uh, you know, that we still, even though they've been, they've been defanged quite a bit uh, by the Chinese government is, is Ant Group, right? Ant Group, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as the starts off as a PayPal for Alibaba, um, and starts as a payments escrow service, takes a thousand euro technology called escrow and brings it to the digital world. And then very quickly, uh, once they're, once they're unshackled from Alibaba and they become an independent company, starts to expand the scope. But the, 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 the model for expansion of the scope was their data, right? And the, and the learning models that it built around the data, because very quickly they saw that they were getting really good information on both consumers and merchants. And once you understood consumers and merchants in their shopping side, you could then offer them banking and credit and savings and insurance and so on and so forth. But that was all being driven by the fact that they were capturing the data and learning from the data and then saying, this helps us increase scope, this helps us increase scale uh, and, and go back and forth as well. Well, it seems like there's a bit of contingency when it comes to the scale and scope of certain companies, right? Like why doesn't Facebook have a payments <laughs> system that's as robust as say, you know, Tencent does? Um, it, it's well, they tried, to, remember they, they, they tried Bitcoin, they tried Bitcoin, they yeah, got smacked down. <laughs> right. But, but the kind the kind of configurations that we see, I mean, look in, in strategy class, we talk about, you know, like I used, we used the Disney case and we say, well, you know, if you got this, IP, you think of all the different ways you can monetize the IP and, and so yes. forth. And that's going to define the, the, the boundaries of the firm. But but the boundaries of, of some of the firms like, you know, Google and, and Amazon and, and Facebook and Microsoft, they're, they're, it's not immediately obvious ex ante that those are sort of the natural contours of the of the companies, right? No, no I agree. I mean, I, I think part of it is... Um, uh, of, of course, the context you find yourself in, right? So, like, surely Amazon, if they wanted to, could 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 become a bank, but the regulatory apparatus in the U.S. for banking is, and the hurdles are way higher than they were in China for for Ant Group, for example. I mean, I think you have to give credit to Zuckerberg. He he, he did good efforts on 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 Libra, and then he got messed up with the whole like, what you got to create your own currency. And you have you have more people than any one country combined. Uh, what? No way. So then the you know the 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 state actors came in and stopped them in many ways. Uh, but they had certainly had the vision for it. Um, and so what's interesting to me now, if you look at Amazon, uh, you know, like even cloud was would not have been what you would anticipate a retailer to go into, but it made sense for them because they had, and then they could t take a big bet, big bet on it and, and make it happen. Uh, and Andy Jassy, the current CEO started the cloud business, right? And so uh, AWS was started by Jassy in many, uh, in many ways. Uh, the, the big bet around healthcare is kind of interesting. Um, you know, I heard, you know, Scott Galloway, the professor at NYU say that, you know, I think there were, there are more people that are prime members in the U S than Amazon prime members in the U S than go to church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, that gives them a lot of entry. Right. And so, so is healthcare the place to play because they, they bought a pharmacy and uh, healthcare in many ways is broken and maybe they can, I love a Amazon healthcare delivery system, right? Because at least returns will be fast. I'd make faster appointments. <laughs> all my data will be in the one place. <laughs> you know, I'll be consolidated. I can I can search at any time, find whatever I want, uh, compare price compare, all those things that we we care about. 
So, so we'll see if they, you know, they make a, a successful dent in this or not. Uh, there have been lots of bodies before who've tried to make a dent in the healthcare system that they haven't been able to. But to your question, uh, you know, contingencies, I, I think absolutely, because I, I do think that the executives respond, you know, to their local environment and then say, given the assets I have, what, what else could I do next? Uh, Amazon's primary asset is Prime now, right? And if you remember when Prime came out, people were like, wow, this sounds stupid. They're going to lose money, like free shipping mm-hmm. for $49, yeah. right? I, I milked it. <laughs> I milked it like a ton. But now yeah. you're addicted, right? Now it's what, 100, 120 bucks or whatever it oh, is. Oh, man, if, right? I, if, I need, and... if I need new tooth floss, it's like one click. I mean, I don't even, yeah. I don't even give it a second thought. Like the idea of going yeah. down to Walgreens. I mean, why would I, <laughs> why would I ever go to Walgreens? Right. <laughs> right. And so, and so, and so, so this is the thing that they, they stumbled onto prime as a way to sort of, uh, you know, drive lock-in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now they're the stop, number one stop. shipper and they just yeah. surpassed UPS and, and FedEx. Right. It, it came about as a, re, as a result to stop multi-homing. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they, they, they capture you. Uh, they subsidize you initially. You're captured. Now you're not going to switch. And, but now you have this relationship that they also give you video. They give you music, you know, and they're, they can start to do additional things with you. And so that's, I think, the interesting thing that, that they've stumbled on. And the question becomes, how can they keep within the context of a U.S. regulatory and competitive FTC environment, how they can, you know, keep, keep expanding their scope? Yeah, and I think the, the the genius of this new organizational model is that it is um, you don't need to know ahead of time what um, your business model or your operation no. model actually is, right? So, no. you know, did Amazon know they're going to be in the delivery business? You know, did they know they were going to do you know third party uh, selling? No. no, no, and and you know they didn't have like a five year Gantt chart to no. figure it out, and they didn't bring in Accenture to you know design the transition strategy. It's yes. like you. You you have the APIs and and if 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 the things start shifting this way, great. If they start shifting that way, great. And yeah. uh, I have a former student who started a fintech and it was a B two C and he got a phone call and after a couple hours with his engineers, it became a B two B and then it became a unicorn. And it was like yes. in one weekend he was able to completely yeah. change the business model and yeah. quadruple the value of the company. Right. It's, it's, Amazing. it's astonishing how quickly you can move when you, when you yes. organize this way. Amazing. It, it, it is quite, it is quite remarkable. Uh, and, and, and does that mean, and, and, does that mean, does, does that mean there's less of a role for strategy and more, I mean, in strategy, right. We've got the external, we've got the internal, um, if you design the organization right so that it's capable of learning, does that mean that you don't have to do as much uh, strategy? Well, look, I mean, I think, I think, I think you, you need to know the basis. You understand differentiation. You need, you need to understand the basis. Right? Like, okay, like, you know, are you focused on quality? Are you going to focus on price? Are you, you know, you got to understand those things, right? I mean, I think mm-hmm. any, any good business person needs to know those distinctions. I'm actually surprised, you know, like in the book, we sort of talk about, business model you say oh it's value creation value capture Mm -hmm. and like i have to tell you greg like you know many people like take down these notes like i'm like wait this is like micro econ 101 like did you not learn Mm -hmm. this like this is what a business is like there's a value creation angle or is a value capture angle like i'm not this is not my new invention for more than it costs to make it (laughs) exactly (laughs) p p greater than c (laughs) you know and i literally write down this equation and go this is all we're saying here, guys, right? Now there's more <laughs> right. ways to create value and there's more, that's your business model. That's your strategy, right? So you've got to understand those things. And so I, I do, so I do think that you, you, you need the basics. I think the question becomes how dynamic are these processes now, right? So if, if we believe that there is time compression, there's half life is shrinking, uh, the agility to be able to ad- keep the foundational knowledge, but the, the, the agility to, to update your priors be like a radical Bayesianist in some ways, um, I think is the, is the key thing. The other thing though, Greg, I have to sort of say is like, like even that, even, and, and maybe it's like there are these two, you know, like uh, I read a lot of science fiction. And so there, there's often like this view of like parallel worlds and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly a lot of 
physics today is sort of is arguing for these multiverses and so forth. And it's not just a sci-fi story. Um, maybe we are living, Greg, in, in two parallel worlds, right? There's the, the digital world, like your student who can pivot and get it and get going and create tremendous value for, for, for customers, for the company, for the shareholders, for the employees, for the customers and so forth. And then there's the other parallel world where, uh, 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 we're, we're still stuck in the fifties, right? And we're like plodding along and we're like, we see, we, we get glimpses and shadows of this other world. And we're like, Oh, what is that? Oh, what is that? And, uh, uh, and we, but we can't switch to this other multiverse. I don't know. I, but but in a way, that, science, there, science fiction. But there, there's, you know, you talk about the collision between the yes. kind of linear and the exponential. I mean, yeah. in some sense, though, they can be complementary, right? Like, you know, Airbnb yeah. is an operating system, but you know, there's yeah. still got to be people who are, <laughs> you know, cleaning, changing the beds and stuff, right? But, yeah, hundred percent. But, but they can, they're gonna, yes, Airbnb is gonna be massively profitable because of the, yes. the economies of, of, of scale there. But, but they also enhance the value, right. Of the, yes. the non-digital world. Cause the non-digital yes. world now is, is, you know, makes it easier for them to, to match with the buyers and, and so yeah. forth. Do all the transactions. So, yeah. And create a whole ecosystem that now everybody needs a cleaner to come in and clean up after the, mm-hmm. the mess has been left by their Airbnb or Absolutely. Right, so it has created demand for more services that way as well in the in the in the in the bits uh, in the atoms uh, in the atomic world, mm-hmm. right? As they play in the in the electro- electronic world, yeah, absolutely. No, no. It, but it, but 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 I, but I think I, but I just wonder, Greg. Like the question I have, uh, let me ask you this question: Like, well, what do you, I mean? Is it that the that the It's a puzzle, no? Like, like again, the example you gave of the student. I have a similar story with one of my students who has a dental AI company. Uh, you know, I'm an investor in it as well, uh, uh, former student. Uh, and uh, what he's been able to do in five years is incredible. And he's just got this flywheel going in this company that's just like uh, scaling like crazy. And having real impact, um, I, I think they're going to become, uh, if they're not already the largest deployment of AI in healthcare, if you think about the industry as a, as a, as a healthcare business, which it is, uh, in five years' time. And it, it, it seems unreal what, when you compare it to the counterfactual of existing companies in that same space. So I, I almost wonder, like, is it that there is a multiverse and there's new laws of physics in that world versus this world? Or is it, you know, like, like, I don't, I don't know how to think about it, actually. I love your thoughts on it. <laughs> well, you know, it's also kind of like, I like to tell everybody, oh, every company's got to be a software company. And, and uh, sometimes people say every company has got to be a platform company. But I mean, you can be a platform or an app. Or, you know, yes. you can be both, yes. right? So, yes. I mean, Google's obviously both platform and yes. an app, but there, there, are, you can just be a pure app, right? Yeah, Netflix and, is a and pure still, app. And yeah. still do well, as long as you interface well with, with the different, with the different yes. platforms, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, one of the questions I have is, you know, Conway's law, I, I love Conway's law, and I talk about it a lot in my class about the need for complementarity between organizational design and your, your product map, et cetera. But is there a, a third piece here, which is the the cultural one? Um, is it? Do we need to to think about the the culture? Uh, is there a need to mm. have different kinds of of people? Right. I mean, if you're going to have a learning organization, do you have to have learning people, or can yeah. the people be the same? What same a great folks, insight. Right? What a great insight. I, I think so. So, if I think about this logically, this is this is intriguing. If I think about this logically, right, like, so we're saying like the new technological architect- architecture requires a new organizational architecture, which would imply as an outcome, a new culture as well, right? Mm-hmm. A new culture is needed in this new new setup. And we sort of see this, like my t- two things hit me, like Sadal Neely, my colleague, yeah. you know, co-wrote a book uh, called The Digital Mindset, 
which sort of argues sort of this cultural change part, like, you know, what you need to do to be, to have the, the digital mindset. They have a, with Paul Leonardi, uh, you know, they have a really nice 30% rule of what you need to understand and so forth. But there's a real, there's a real oral culture story embedded within there. And they're both, you know, OB, OB scholars. Um, and then, um, um, Andy McAfee just has a new book come out about geek culture as well. Mm -hmm. So, so, and I, and I wonder if it's like, if that's like a derivative, if it's a input or output, you know, like, yeah. So the, Mar the Marxian, of... the Marxian view would be, it's like superstructure, right? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have, I have a, a, a lot of companies and students say, okay, do you, do you, if you want to have a data driven culture, you know, do you start with the culture? And my view is if, if you, if you go th stand up in front of your organization and say, like, we're a data-driven culture, and then people are like, okay, and then they go to try to do something, and, you know, it, it's like, well, and everything works, is by right? facts. Like, everything is by facts, like, yeah. All my, all my <laughs> columns are in different, you know, data files. Like, how am I supposed to do this? Then the, you lose all credibility. I mean, I did a project yeah. for one company that I'll leave unnamed, and they brought me in to do data science for their IT team. They took a whole bunch of data scientists, sent them off to – learn about data science and they came back and they couldn't do anything. So they all quit, right? Because the, the, the architecture wasn't set up, the, not, not only the organizational architecture, but like the data architecture was not set up in a way that yeah. enabled them to do any data science. Yeah, no, exactly. And you know, you know, what I see often is, uh, you know, CEOs go to Davos, they get the AI yeah. bug. Okay. We're going to hire AI people. We need AI, AI, we need AI magic everywhere. Uh, and uh, so they go, they go to Stanford, they go to Berkeley, they go to MIT, they go to Harvard, they, you know, Caltech, they hire all the PhDs in AI and a million dollars a year or whatever. They try to compete with Google to hire AI scientists. Mm -hmm. And then what do the AI scientists end up doing? A, they end up quitting in a couple of years time. But why do they quit? Well, because their job is to be a data engineer because the data story is so terrible inside of their companies, right? And then you basically have to sit there and have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, bring in the lawyers, right? Who owns this data? Where is this data? Can you, can you email me the spreadsheet? Can you, you know, they, that's all they do. And so, so you're absolutely right. Like you can, you know, it's not credible when the CEO stands up and we're a data, we're a data driven culture when in fact, data is hoarded data is a mess is garbage in garbage out in these organizations and they haven't done the homework to fix it yeah i mean because you talk a lot about microsoft and i know marco has done a lot of work with with microsoft yeah. um but i was just talking to bob setton recently and he was talking about the the cultural shift right that that happened that Sacha, you know said we're, we're not only going to change the organization we're going to we're, we're going to change the culture and you know yeah. did them sort of simultaneously right and so I'm wondering, yeah. you, you also talk about GE. I, I used to teach that case, the, um, the GE case, right? Yeah. <laughs> the that, did, did, um, I know Marco was. I wrote, wrote it with Marco. Uh, I, you, you know, know I, worked at, I started my career at GE. So, oh, yeah. so you guys co-authored that, that case. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it was, I used to hold up GE as the shining. Same example, here. <laughs> right. And, and I used to be like, they, they get it. Right. Like, and, and I used to have Bill Rue, Bill Rue come, yes. used to come and speak at, at, at Berkeley and stuff. But I mean, they really, they, that, that whole thing was a disaster. So, you know, what, what can we learn from that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think, and, and you know, what's interesting is that I, I've met all the key principles there and they really believed the story. Mm -hmm. They really did. And they invested in the story too. But I think, I think this goes back down to the, the structure and incentives. It was set up, G Digital was set up as a separate business unit. Mm -hmm. uh, it was asked to become a for-profit you know. business, yeah. you know, uh, and then immediately got into conflicts with all the other BUs. Like, why would the healthcare business work with you? Why would the aerospace business work with you? Mm -hmm. Whose customer is it? And all the pissing matches that happens when you have inner BU rivalry are on the same customer, right? So they would have and like a transfer price or... Oh, you know, God, they, but not, they, they, they wouldn't even share. They'd be like fighting yeah. over, over customer access. Mm -hmm. Right. Is Boeing aircraft engines customer or can, uh, uh, you know, can, uh, can there's, there's a call on them and who's going to build, who's going to keep the revenue credits for that right. and so forth. And so I do think that, uh, good old incentives, uh, came in the way, uh, and, or design came in the way of what was, what was truly a visionary strategy. They got it. They understood it. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, but the but the 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 separate PL structure really hurt them. They made some bad technological choices, but I don't think that those were fatal. To be quite honest, I, I really believe that the the P and L structure really hurt them. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, Mike Tushman uh, did. Um, I think there might even be an interview as a uh, autopsy from from Bill Rue. I should I should find that and send it to you. I think he did a video interview with Bill Rue uh, about those things m m most m most recently. Um, but yeah, but, uh, so I, I do think that, 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 that was purely the board got it, CEO got it, the C-suite got it, but then I think the design again, the, or design story came in. Now, of course, a lot of the book is about networks. Um, you know, do, where should we be teaching networks? I mean, I teach it in my, my strategy class. Um, but the strategy class is getting a little overloaded. <laughs> it's got, <laughs> got to do a lot of work. Um, do we, should we just have an entire class, just a whole class just on, on, you know, networks and, and how they work? I mean, do you do that so, in the operations group? At, yeah. At I mean, I think, I think, I think there's like a, we do a little bit in our ops class as well, but I don't think anybody does a really good job with it, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. Um, and I almost think that, um, you know, like I'm, I'm toying with this idea of, a um, of a new course on like leading with AI or something like that, where, where we would build in a bunch of, of these concepts anyway. So just, just for reinforcing, because I often find, you know, what's surprising to me, Greg, is that how much people in these platform businesses with network effects don't understand network effects. Mm -hmm. Like I've talked to people at, you name the platform company in Silicon Valley, really senior executives in those companies. And I go, uh, you know, you have direct network effects and they're like, look at me. Like they understand a little bit of this, but they actually can't explain the dynamics of it. Um, well, well, now if you, you know, pitch to a VC, they're going to, that's yes. going to be the question, you know, what are your exactly. network effects? And so everybody's exactly. going to say, oh, there's yeah. network effects, but yeah. you know, you point out the difference in YouTube and, and, and Netflix, for instance. I mean, yes, exactly. Everyone thinks, oh, same thing, digital, but no, the, the, the network effects are, are, are very different. Yeah. In fact, in fact, you know, my colleague, uh, but Marco and Fang Zhu have done some great, you know, Fang Zhu has these great cases on all the different types of network effects that can exist and, and what they actually mean. I've learned a ton by reading his papers and his cases and teaching his cases. And he's actually built an amazing simulation uh, that allows you to build, run a, a platform business and you compete with somebody else's platform businesses. And you put into different worlds. You're in a world where there's, uh, you know, lots of multi-homing and no and weak network effects or uh, low multi-homing and, and strong network effects, direct network effects uh, to sort of see see what, the, what what would you do and how would you do that? So I do, I do believe in many ways, I do think that the, the network effect story was complete on its own in the 2000s and 2010s. But now I think it's like network effects with data and with AI. And that's why like I'm thinking this leading with AI course has to have uh, a primer on network effects because that's the, because as you're getting part of the exponential story is as you're getting more and more data from your increasing returns business, right? You can then apply it to a whole bunch of different things. And so, so that's why, that's why when we wrote the book, uh, the book was gonna, we had so many different names for the book and we, we tried to write the book so many different times. Uh, and somebody else wrote the book <laughs> that we were trying to write. Uh, we were gonna call the book, The Graph Economy. <laughs> I still love that name. <laughs> um, uh, but we both thought it was, I think only sell like five copies or something. It was called the graphic. I mean, you, you would buy one for sure. I know, Greg, but uh, not many of the people. Would buy buy the it, I don't care book. what it's called. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 uh, but the reason why we say it is like when algorithms and networks rule the world, because the, the age of AI came about from platform companies. They were sitting on a pile of data. Uh, they were sitting on a pile of compute and they're like, well, well how are, there's no, you know, there's no way Uber can run itself as a traditional taxi business. There's no way Google can run itself as a traditional auction house. You had to be set up in a very different way. And that's where the AI stuff. And so I think I see them as being 
uh, inexorably linked. And as, as you were sort of saying, even if you're not a platform company, you're going to be playing in a platform world. So you got to understand how you're going to fit in, how you can do multi-homing, how you're going to actually prevent, how you're going to think about your data strategy if you're multi-homing across different platforms and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's how they're, I see them as being linked. They're, they're, they're separate concepts, but their co-occurrence and the exponential value you get in combining them together, I think, uh, begs, I think, at least from my, in my mind, that they should be put, put together. Now, look, ChatGPT is the latest generation of, um, of AI, and it, it just accentuates the questions that you've already been asking, right? So in mm -hmm. particular, um, what's the appropriate division of labor between humans and, and algorithms? And the other yeah. is, um, you know, what data is going to be uh, made proprietary, right? So yeah. the initial generation of uh, Gen AI, it, it's been able to leverage the fact that there's just this enormous amount of data that's in the public domain. Do you think we'll see a um, fragmentation of that data as, as companies start to build these walls around their, their data repositories? Um, will, will the next gen, gen AI, I mean, will be, you'll have this, you'll have this gen AI API on the back end, and then you'll be able to build these proprietary um, solutions built on, on the, uh, on the, on the functionalities. I, I think, um, so, you know, a few things. I, I mean, uh, let me answer your question first, and then I'll give you my framework about what, what generative AI is doing as well. So, so, so I would first say that, that, the that the, um, and I, and I'm, I'm not a unbiased observer in this. I'm, you know, on the board of Mozilla Corporation. We just set up as part of our foundation efforts, set up, set up Mozilla.ai with the belief that, uh, heterogeneity in large language models, both large and small large language models will, will be needed going into the future. So we're working actively to create an open source view of, uh, of, of generative AI systems, um, and actively working to build the infrastructure for it and the systems for it and so on and so forth and to, and to make, make this available to the rest of the world. Um, and so, so with that lens and with that, with that disclaimer, uh, what I imagine is that we will be living in an end world where these large language models that exist from uh, from Google, well, whenever Google gets back together and actually releases something credible, um, Bard and Palm so far not that credible. Uh, but you look at GPT you, four, you look at Claude uh, from Anthropic, um, even Llama from Facebook, which is the open source version. Uh, there will be a place for those large language models because they are able to do a lot uh, with surprising capabilities. Like we, you know, these models weren't trained to excel in LSAT, but they can, mm -hmm. or excel in GMAT, but they can. So, I what I imagine is that companies as part of their AI factory will be evoking, depending on the task, different types of large language models for the, for the, for the tasks at hand. Uh, for, some, for some functions, because the data is sensitive, minor PII, you might have a private uh, uh, model inside uh, that interacts with the broader one, but it, doesn't, but it doesn't go across. Some will build on top of it, and some might even, I imagine a world where, where depending on the, on the use case, you might even have different uh, agents representing different models collaborating or competing to solve the problem. Uh, and that doesn't seem that far away, to be quite honest. Well, um, I mean, do you think we'll have more of these kind of deep vertical specializations? Or I think we'll have both. An, or will it be an advantage to, you know, agglomerating, you know, I think, I think both. Different I, think, yeah. I, I think both. I think both. Uh, and so then, then the question of data strategy becomes quite interesting. Uh, you know, uh, one thing, uh, you know, uh, I'm just going to turn, it's getting dark here. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm like all very bright. Uh, um, one thing that is, um, uh, so here's a personal choice I face these days, right? Uh, and I'm, there was no anticipation of this world, uh, but I'm glad I did this. So I, you know, I, I became an academic because of open source. 
and Creative Commons and that kind of stuff. And so as soon as the publishers allowed you to put your stuff in Creative Commons licenses, I would buy out the copyrights from the publishers, from our academic journals. And I'd, so most of my papers are in the Creative Commons, right? And what am I doing? I'm making sure that all my papers are uploaded into Claude, into Llama, into, into Gen AI, into uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, because I want them to train off what I've written, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the interesting conundrum that companies will face uh, is if you're not, if your data and your, your point of view is not in these large language models yeah. and they become the place where people begin their, their work, are you, are you, do you, do you, do you, do you even exist? Right. right. So this is a, it's a new form of bias, right? So it's the, the training data is, is, is going to be biased in favor of the folks who are, you know, pushing their, their product into the, into the public domain. hundred percent. And so like, and I, those, I, those I, could I, be people with agendas, right? I mean, your agenda is to make yeah. sure that people receive your wisdom. There's exactly. Oh, or lack thereof. View of wisdom, right? <laughs> lack thereof. Exactly. Right. And so, and so, but this place is an existential crisis for all the publishing houses that are attached to universities, because right now, you know, Berkeley has a press, mm -hmm. you know, HBS is a massive press. We have a lot of press. Should we put our stuff in those, in those systems? And I say, yes. Why would we, why would we, why would we curtail the world not knowing from our knowledge? Right. But it smacks right against our business model of making money and maybe we'll create our own and we will, you know, a Harvard business school bots. We'll create many bots, but, mm -hmm. But those bots will never have the scale and will in the end be discriminatory to our knowledge mission as educators, as scholars. Like society gives us this license to pick on, to work on topics that we care about, uh, change topics that we want uh, in return for us disclosing the knowledge to the rest of the world. Why would we create a business model on top of it that prevents it? And now that this world, this new tool is available, why would we stop that from being available? But you can imagine like the, the discussions in the dean's offices and the provost offices and the in the board of directors for these presses about oh my god all of our knowledge is being stolen the same dilemma is going to happen inside and outside of companies and what is your data strategy what will you select and reveal what will you keep private what will give you an advantage or not and so i don't know if any b school right now any strategy course has any module on data strategy do they i don't think they do uh, well, I, like I used to teach you... a course called I used to teach a course called Data Strategy. Um, oh, but um... geez, Greg, I need to I need to see that course, <laughs> right? But but um, but, but, but it's not needs, but it's not foundational. <laughs> yeah, but but also, but Greg, it's not like not all MBA programs. That's not it's not canonical now in yeah. you know like in um, in MBA curriculum, right? Like that might be an elective course, right? Not not a foundational course. Selective, yeah, it's elective. Yeah, I mean, foundation. We still do, you know. Apple and Intel and yeah, Coke yeah. And Coke, Coke, Coke. I mean, like Coke and Pepsi. Like, are you kidding me? Like, okay, uh, <laughs> I don't think Claude, Claude, and OpenAI is Coke versus <laughs> Pepsi. I don't think so, right? I don't think so. I don't. Maybe uh, not. Could be. Maybe. Maybe this little brand story there. I don't know. Um, but look, you said maybe you said this little point. Sometime. So you, you said it in the book that if you you know if you don't recognize the threat of these exponential models early enough, then, you know, you know you're going to be in trouble. And, and so we, we know about this term technical debt. Is there, should we be thinking in terms of organizational debt? Like if you oh. don't, if, if you don't set up the organization in the right way and you just keep trying to patch it and patch it and patch it, you're just increasing the cost of the transformation. And, you know, you, you got to do what Jeff Bezos did and just get that memo out. I mean, yes. is, is that the, yeah. how, is, are, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I really think so. I think there's a, and you know, um, uh, Mickey Mikitani uh, at, at Rakuten uh, has, has said, CEO of Rakuten has said uh, that the ability to change your organization is going to be an advantage that companies have. Uh, and he believes that that's a skill. That's a learned skill and acquired skill. Uh, and uh, and that hopefully curtails the organizational debt that you're, that you're mentioning. Absolutely. Yeah. I think someone said all management now is 
change management. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, my, my joke now is uh, change management, but a comma after change. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, Kareem, thanks so much. We could we could talk all day. I, I, I do at some point want to learn more about what you guys are, are teaching over there at, at, at Harvard so I can beg, borrow, and, and steal. Whatever take all of it. Take all of it. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm uh, going hitting you up. For d your, d your just decide us a lot. That's all That's all I care about. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll, we'll do. Um, but great chatting. Hopefully, we'll, we'll chat again Thank soon you, and, and you yeah. know, get another book out. Uh, update the book. Yeah, I, I'm, trying to, I'm, try, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Thank you, Greg. Okay. We'll see you. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.